Well, I would love to welcome in all of our locations. And so Prescott Valley at Park Collective, that is you, Heights family there. Um, I saw in the chat, there's a bunch of you on the online live gathering. The family is spread all over, a bunch of places in California. I saw some other ones there from around Arizona. And then Alabama's there, just a whole bunch of good stuff. And then we would normally welcome in Paulden right now. But Paulden is here in person, y'all, in the front row. Let's welcome them, Prescott. So you get, to, you get to hear us welcome in Paulden every week if you're, if you're here on the Prescott location or even out on the online family. Well, they are here in person. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But welcome, you guys. Glad you're with us. And Prescott, welcome to you. You're looking good. Um, you were smart. The weather is much nicer now than 17 degrees this morning. So well done. Um, I see a Cowboys jersey. Is that, is that for real? Cowboys for real? Did you hear the laughter that followed? What was that? Uh, or maybe the 49ers. Any 49ers? Okay. Okay. It's about the same. Good. So there'll be an equal amount of you laughing and crying all at the same time. So, so there we go. But um, the what? As long as they beat the Cowboys? Are we still calling the Cowboys America's team, by the way? Okay, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Anyways, we'll move on. So uh, welcome. If you're here and you're new and you're like, I came to church, we're talking football. Welcome to the family. You just never know. You just never know. So we do call ourselves a family. We are in a series called Together. And so if you're new, here's what I want you to get. One, you are welcome here. We are glad you're along with us. Um, we welcome you as you are, and, and we hope that you just discover um, as, as you journey alongside us that this is a safe place to be and, and that um, questions are welcome and all of that as you go. And, and those of you that are family, I hope that you've discovered that. Um, I made a joke about, you know, there's people that are old to this space, like they've been here a while. And we often think of old as a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. But, but sometimes it, it, it can be one of those things that we go, man, I'm just so familiar that, no, 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 you're still vital to the family. We're on this journey together. And, and so we're supposed to be growing. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, just, just want you to know that whether it's the online family you're in or whether it's in Prescott Valley or here and you're new, welcome. We love you and you came at a good time. Because what we're doing is we're talking about this idea of um, God has put us in community. You, you realize that God has always been working through community and he's put us together and we need each other. Um, we need each other, not only for each other, but also to accomplish what God has given us and the mission that we're on um, as we as we live out his purpose. You might be wondering, John, why do you have a Youth Alive sweatshirt on? Like, aren't you a little old for that? Yes, I am. Thanks for asking. Uh, so. Uh, if you were in the service a number of months ago in the 830, these two rows down the front here are normally packed with high schoolers. Yes, they come to 830 so that they don't take up space in this service. Isn't that amazing that they're, they're serving the rest of us by providing space so they get up early on a Sunday. Um, I'll just be honest, in high school, I wouldn't have been that guy, but they are. And they were here and they all, there was a handful of them that had these sweatshirts on. And I looked at them and I went, I, I like your sweatshirt. Can I have one? And they said, yeah, we'll get you one. And which Pastor Austin, who you just saw, was with them. And he's been asking for a while and they wouldn't give him one. So he was a little offended by the whole thing. But, uh, but uh, I said, if you get me one, I'll wear it on a weekend. So here I am wearing it on a weekend. But here's what I want you to catch. It, it fits what we're talking about. Because what Youth Alive is, is within our high schools in the area, it's, it's students that have made the effort to have an adult or a teacher sponsor this club at their school. And Youth Alive is a way for them to express their faith, to make a safe space for those that are followers of Jesus, but also make a welcoming space for those that don't know Jesus um, at their school on their campus every single week. And, and, and I just found out that the, the Prescott High one is the largest Youth Alive. There's 145 kids that are involved. And, and it's just as beautiful. But what I want you to, yeah, we can celebrate. But what I want you to get is this, that it's students reaching students. And that's how this is supposed to work. That we're in it together, but reality is most of us in this room, including myself, I'm old. I'm not gonna reach youth. But students need to reach other students. 
And so to see students stepping forward on the Prescott High School and the Bradshaw High School and the um, a AAEC, I believe it's the initials of it are, high school, um, they, they call it the Horsey High. So there you go, those of you that are in that. But, but the reality is this, that, that the students are together trying to reach other students together, and that's how this was always designed to be. We need each other. And we are not going to accomplish what God's given us unless we're in it together. And so if you're in the room and you go, hey, I know somebody at Bradshaw, then you need to encourage them to link arms with the Youth Alive kids. Um, if you know people in Prescott or you know people at Horsey High, like get them involved. Get them involved um, because we need our students to reach other students. And we're here to empower them to do that. That's part of our mission is to empower them. So if you're old and you're like, John, why are we talking about youth? Because here's the thing, youth are the church of today, not the church of tomorrow. They're already here, and we're supposed to empower them and lead them forward. Um, so kind of capturing that then, we've been talking about mission and vision. So, so our mission over the last few weeks we've talked about, you'll see it on screen. The idea behind our mission is this, that we exist. This is why Heights Church, Heights Family is here. We exist to see people encounter Jesus. That's why we're here, church. That's why we exist, to see people encounter Jesus, to see people engage in their faith with Jesus and see people empowered to serve Jesus. So we will give everything we have to the mission we've been given. So, so if you wonder why we're doing something, you can chase it back to this statement here. This is our mission. This is why we do it. You could sum it up in this, that we are making disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples, and that does not stop. It continues. Uh, along with that, then, we have our vision, and our vision is how. So if, if our mission is why we exist, then this is how we are accomplishing our mission. We talked about this last week. And, and that, the idea behind this is just in a way that is relevant to the community. So not relevant to us. Our vision is not about us. It's about in a way that's relevant to where God has put us, wherever you find us. We will be helping people live the life they were created for in Jesus. That's what we're going to be about. That, that that's going to anchor us true north. So if we've got our why and we've got our how, today we're going to talk about our goals and what we are up to in the next year. And, and all of this, to be honest with you, all of this, this mission, vision, it reminds me of food. Okay? So, so I don't know what your house is like, but in my house, we have different kinds of cooks. Okay? So you, you have the, the cooks that go to the, to the kitchen and they look at all the things that are there and go, oh, if I put that with that and that with that and that with that, maybe it would turn out to be that, right? And so it's just this hodgepodge of like, we had these ingredients and we got these spices and we kind of threw them all together and it tastes like chili every time. I don't know why, right? <laughs> and and so, so you have that style of cooking, but then you have another style. And the other style of cooking is... Um, Hey, I need you to go to the store. I need you to pick up these ingredients. And when those ingredients arrive, then it's like, I'm going to take this recipe and I'm going to follow this recipe every single piece of it. Why? Because I'm trying to create a very intentional meal that, ta that tastes a very intentional way. But so, so in, in the context of what we're talking about, you have your goal, you have your mission. What you're trying to do is the meal at the end of it. You, you have your recipe, which is how, but you have all these ingredients and all these ingredients have to go together if you're going to make the meal on the other end. I mean, imagine if you went to your favorite restaurant and you get to your favorite restaurant, you get the menu, which if it's your favorite, maybe you've already got your favorite meal and you order that meal. But when that goes back to the kitchen staff, the kitchen staff are like, yeah, it's a Tuesday. We don't feel like following the recipe. We're just going to decide how we want that meal to taste. When you get that meal, you would go, this isn't what was intended. Why? Because the ingredients were different. And so if we're going to accomplish the mission that God's put in front of us, we've got to understand the ingredients that God has put together for us to combine on this way to completing this mission. And, and so what I'd love to do is just slow down and talk about the ingredients that is us, the church family that God's put here. That, that, that what he's put here is everything we need to accomplish the mission that he's given us. And so if you have a Bible um, or you want to turn it on, we're in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. 
And the context is this, that Jesus is about to leave the planet, so to speak. He's about to um, ascend into heaven. Uh, he, he has gone through the cross. He's, he's paid the penalty for sin for all of humanity. Uh, he's, he's nailed to the cross. He's put in a tomb and, and he conquers death by through his resurrection. And now he sits in that period of from resurrection to when he ascends. And he, he's, we're told in scripture that he's seen by like 500 people, over 500 people. And now this is one of the last moments um, in, in, in that span. And so in verse four, it says this, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And, and so you have the disciples and they're gathered around him and they're like, okay, now's the time. This is it, right? This is what we've been talking about. Is, is Jesus is now the time when the kingdom is going to be restored back to Israel. And Jesus looks at him and he goes, it's not for you to know. And I wonder how many of us in our journey, and especially in the church culture that's, that's being created and growing, we get so concerned by knowing, is, is this all lining up exactly as it should? Is this, is this what it should be? And over and over in scripture, God tells us, he goes, you're not going to know. You're not going to know when the time is. And, and what I love is Jesus kind of sidesteps and goes, you're not going to know, but here is what's going to happen. So, so, so today, like instead of focusing on we don't, what we don't know, we're focusing on what we do know. And what is one of those ingredients that's been given to us as a church family when it comes to accomplishing the mission that God's put in front of us? It's that you will receive power from the Holy Spirit. That, that right here, right now, what you need to know as a follower of Jesus that in your life, you have been gifted the Holy Spirit. That just days later for this group of people, at a moment we call Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down. And from that moment on, the Holy Spirit has been indwelling believers that at the moment of conversion, you have been given power. That makes you supernatural, by the way, when God indwells you, right? Because God is giving you power. Why? Because of what he says next to them. So one of the ingredients is he puts power. The next thing he tells them is, you're going to be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem first. And then in all Judea, Samaria, and to all parts of the world. Now, for them, it took something called persecution to help them move. Why? Because what Jesus tells them is, you're going to receive power. But what we need to know, the ingredient that we've been given to work with, is this was always meant to move outward. You know that, right? That this, what we've been given was always designed to, to grow and move outward. That, that if, you, if you're somebody that you go, John, I'm, I tried heights, I'm trying it again. I just don't like big churches. I don't know if you're gonna like heaven. <laughs> because what heaven is, it's a gathering of everyone. And you get to the end of Revelation, and what we get in Revelation is that, that God declaring that he is our God and we are his people. And we will be gathered in the song we just sang. We will be gathered around the throne. We'll be gathered in his presence. 
this new heavens and new earth where he dwells with us. But it's going to be a lot of people. And guess what? A lot of them aren't going to look like you and me. It's going to be a gathering together. A lot of them are going to have different languages, right? It's beautiful. But that's where this thing is heading, that God is having a a gathering of people, a community of people. And so this was always designed to move outward. If you're here and you're like, John, I like my chair and I like it when people don't try and take my seat. (laughs) Can I tell you that's the opposite of what this is supposed to be? This is supposed to be a space where people are fighting for your seat. Why? Because if we're on mission and this thing is meant to move outward, we're supposed to grow as a family. It's supposed to be something that continues to grow. If we get to the point, church, where we're not growing, where we're not reaching people, and please hear me well, this is not about growing Heights Church. This is about the kingdom of God. This is about the church. This is about being on mission. This is about giving our lives to what God called us to. That when we said yes to Jesus, he gave us a mission. And as a part of that mission, what we should be about is that we're always willing to move outwards. We're not about just being here and making this the best little kingdom it can be. We're supposed to be in the uncomfortable in the growth. How do I know that? Those early disciples, um, it says after Stephen, one of the early disciples, as he was being stone, like not stone from what he was doing, stone by people throwing stones at him to kill him. And he's still speaking and seeing a vision of heaven. It says immediately after he died, persecution spread. And guess what happened to the church? The church spread. Why? Because they become static and comfortable. And God goes, I need this to move outward. This was always designed to move out. One of the ingredients we have, church, is this was never designed to stay as it is. It's designed to grow and be this organic movement outward towards people. Why? Because we exist to what? See people encounter Jesus, engage in their faith, and empowered to serve. Which when you're empowered to serve, it means you're moving outward, not inward. So this whole thing is a movement. It's moving forward. And so we have power as an ingredient. We have movement outward as an ingredient. And then at the end of this, it says Jesus ascended into heaven. Right? And then we're told he will return. So what I know today is his mission hasn't changed. You know why? He didn't return and give us a new one. And so today we can count on, we can guarantee with confidence that we know we're about the right thing. Why? Because Jesus gave it to us, then he left. When he returns, it will be different. But for today, it's not, which means that we have this time. We've been given time. We don't know how long that time is. But part of the ingredient that we have is we have power, that we have this movement outwards and we have time. Now, when Paul's talking to the church in, in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter four, Paul's writing a letter to them and he's telling them about the church and what it is. And in verse 11, it says this. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. So, so Jesus gives gifts to the church and those gifts are people. Now, when it comes to apostles and evangelists, that has to do with church planting. I don't know if you've ever met somebody that that I've had the privilege in the past of meeting someone and they're like, he's like, yeah, I'm on my, I think I'm on church 36 at this point. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I planted 35 churches. He has been given a gift. We have been given a gift by Jesus, the church. There are people that their passion, what they're driven by is they just have to go and establish churches and they'll be the first ones to tell you, I'm terrible at staying. I wasn't made to stay. Have you ever met somebody that when you're with them, you go, I wish I had what you had because you can talk to a complete stranger about Jesus and it makes 100% sense to them and all of a sudden, they're now wanting to accept Jesus and walk with him and, and those are evangelists. People that are just natural at reaching out to people and bridging gaps and being able to take the gospel with them. They're gifts to the church. Prophets. Prophets have carried different things in different seasons. In the early church, when there was no scriptures, the prophets spoke very specifically into situations. Prophets today carry a different role in a different place. But then you get to these pastors and teachers, and they say that these people are gifts given by Jesus. 
And so pastors and teachers, which that word pastor, a better translation is shepherd. It's somebody that cares for, like a shepherd would care for sheep. It's the same idea that they care for, they nurture, they look after, they protect, all of that. But it says that th these people have been given as a gift to the church. Now, if you think of pastors and teachers, it's the day to day. It's the caring for us, right? And then, so why? Why all these gifts? Next verse says this to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up, to equip. That word equip carries with it this idea of being fitted for a purpose. Who's being fitted for the purpose? Us, all of us, right? That there's a unique purpose in Jesus that you are being fitted for. And so what, it, what the verse is saying is that, hey, these people, the pastors, the teachers, they've been given as a gift. And the gift is this, to equip, to fit you for a purpose. Because here's the thing, when we talk about together and we talk about the church, in modern Western church, we've made this person up here, right? This is the expert. This is the person that does the work of the church. No. That was never intended in scripture. What the role of the church is and the ministries of the church and all the different people that are stepping into the role of shepherds in your life, what their role is, is to fit you for the purpose that God has for you. Church, hear me well. You, you are needed in the kingdom of God. There's not one of you. We just sang a song. I don't know if you caught the lyrics. If I'm not dead, God's not done. And we sang it over and over. Last I checked, at least nobody's pointed out yet that somebody's not breathing next to you, right? <laughs> Last I checked, we're all still alive, which means that God's not done that you have a purpose in the kingdom of God that's been fitted to you. you. You are part of the ingredients that God has given in what? In completing and making this meal of what? Making disciples everywhere we go. You're vital. We need you. Why? Continues on. So that the body of Christ may be built up, verse 13, until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That your service that you've been fitted for, your service that you have, your purpose that you have is to build everyone up around you. It's construction language. What we've been given is construction. And here's, here's the best way I can play it out for you. If you're building a house, you don't want the plumber doing your electrical, right? You don't want the framer doing your finish work. No knock on framers. We just don't want that, right? You don't want the person who pours your concrete to be your roofer. Like, and this is how this works as the body of Christ, that as you're equipped, as you're fitted for your purpose, you have a role to the rest of the family. What is that role? To help build us up, to complete the building. You may be the one that walks in and goes, these walls are still drywall. Why has no one painted them? Because you're the painter. Why? Because God has uniquely given you power He's given you a mission to follow. He's given you a movement outward away from yourself towards others. He's given you time. And now he's equipped you. He's fitted you for a purpose. And in fitting you for that purpose, in fitting you for that purpose, you have a unique spot in finishing construction. What are we building towards? That we would be the fullness of Christ. And what does that look like? He continues on then. Verse 14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deep, deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth and love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. Jesus is the leader of this church. You just need to know that he is the head of this church. The rest of us, we're just all serving him. 
And so each of us have a unique role to play in what? In his kingdom, in his church. And so it goes on to say then, from him, the whole body, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love. He is the one that holds us together. Can, can we just be clear for a minute, church? It's not how good the preaching is, because that's seriously debatable, right? That doesn't hold us together. It's not how good the music is, as phenomenal as they are. That does not hold us together. It's not how good if men, if you went to men's breakfast yesterday, it's not how good the eggs were, right? It's not how good breakfast was. It's not how good being around a table was. That doesn't hold us together. It's not how good the things we do are that hold us together. It's not having the right, you know, we, we, we get the right lighting or the right songs or we get the right success or we get the right people. That's not what holds this together. Jesus holds us together, period. How do I know that? I lived through 2020. I've lived through seasons at heights. And I don't mean this in a, in a way that anybody did anything out of line from a leadership perspective, but I'll be honest with you, if it was based on our ability of leadership, this would have fallen apart. But Jesus holds it together, why? Because it's his church. And when it comes to you, you just need to know as he holds you together, he has a purpose unique for you. The last words there of that verse, as each work, we are built up, we are built up as each, each part, as each part. You are one of those eaches. As each part does its work. God has a work for you. You're needed. You're a part of this. We're in this together. God works in and through community. He always has. And you, you are needed. And so we put all that into our bowl and begin to mix, right? And so then the question becomes, what are we doing with all those ingredients over the next year? What are we doing? Where are we heading? What can you look forward to? Well, remember, we started this thing called Park Collective, and remember this time last year, we were like, oh, if we can just get the doors open. And then we got the doors open. And we're like, oh, so good. And then we were like, man, if we could just see some people kind of step into the park, I wonder if it's going to get used. Yesterday, we had 668 people come through those doors. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> and so we're not asking the same questions. 668 people used the park. We had a service there. I remember talking and going, if we could just have a service. In the next year with Park Collective, places we hope it goes. We hope that those 668 people that were on one day, however many that is in a week, which adds up to a year, our heart is now, church, we have to do the hard work of making connections for those people to what? To things that will help their life. Why? So that we can, because remember, we're mixing. What are we mixing for? We're mixing in a way that's relevant to them, because that's the recipe we're following. What? That they would encounter Jesus. So it's a, an entire community that's using a park. We need to build connections for them to encounter Jesus, to engage in their faith. We're going to be working on that through things like parenting classes, through financial help, through a class named Alpha, which we'll talk about in a little bit, through other, other avenues of marriage and, and so on and so on creating safe space for the community to use. We still haven't bridged the gap yet of, John, I'm in the community. I, I'm not part of a religious affiliation, but we just need a space to meet. That space was designed for them to meet. We've got to bridge those gaps over the next year. We've also got to continue to pay down debt. It was a big dream. It's a big thing in front of us. And you just need to know, as Austin talked about generosity, that your generosity is continuing to build and move Park Collective forward. It's a part of what we've committed to as a family. And you just need to know that, that for you, you may be sitting here, how do I get involved with Park Collective? There's many, many ways. And over the next year, we hope that you can connect and grow into some of those. Why? Because what we're doing is we're on mission. And along with that, we're... Over the next year, we're going to lean into something called the Discipleship Pathway. You're going to hear a bunch about it over the next months, especially. But the Discipleship Pathway thinks through the thought process of if you're sitting here on any weekend or you happen to go to the website on any day of the week 
and you go, I feel like I need to step in and grow more in my faith. I feel like I need to engage in my faith. The pathway is designed for you to do that. One of the specific ways is this. We try to make four real simple groupings of people. For example, if you are new here, and that means if you are new to heights, or you are new to your faith, or you're new to faith in general, this would be a section for you. And so inside of new here, what you would find is this thing called growth track. So if you are new to the church, you move from somewhere else, or you just happen to show up, this is designed for you to go to something called growth track. Why? So that you can discover what's the church about and how do I step in and be a part. But now if you're here and you go, John, I don't know Jesus yet, but I have a ton of questions. Well, under new here, you'll find something called Alpha that Austin talked about that you saw the video about. That Alpha is designed to be a safe space that whether you know Jesus or you don't, but you have questions, real questions, that you can go and it's a safe space for you to step into a conversation about those questions. Why? Because we, we grow and move through our questions. There's also stuff coming in there like basics and basics will have to do with an eight, eight week journey where someone who has made a decision for Jesus, it's a one-on-one -on -one that helps them to be established in their faith. Here's the foundations. Why are foundations important? We just sang about it, right? That are firm foundations that when the storms come because of our foundations, we know that we can stand firm in our faith. And so Within the new here, that's part of, part of what you'll discover. There's other people here that, that they're like, okay, I got that. I'm at the church, but I want to grow with people because you keep telling me this is how we do discipleship at Heights. Well, grow with people has things like life groups in it. There were signups for those last week. This is great. You know this, right? This is part of this equipping that we were talking about, this being fitted for a purpose. But when you get from this into a room with 10, 12, 20 people and you are facing each other and now you're heart to heart, it'll transform your life. And so we grow with people. We were designed to be with people. We were designed to grow in community. Other ways that that happens, if you went to men's breakfast yesterday, you heard them talk about groups that meet. There's Bible studies. There's also affinity groups that meet within that. And so if you love golf, there's a bunch of guys that love golf and you can go do that. Or if you shoot guns, because apparently men are supposed to shoot guns, then you can go shoot guns, right? But, but the whole idea is that there's groups with people. You are growing with people. There's another group of people that, that are here that go, John, I walked with Jesus a long time. I feel like I still don't understand this book. Well, you heard a couple of weeks ago that, that the idea of knowing more, that you're one of those people that go, I just want to know more. Well, we offered a gift three weeks ago called Right Now Media. And what Right Now Media does is puts in your hands, in your access at any point of your life, you can do things like devotionals, you can do things like verse by verse through the Bible, you can go topical to marriage, parenting, whatever it happens to be, finances. But you need to know more. Today, today, if you're here and you go, I mean, I, I hear you guys talk about generosity, but I just don't feel like I, I understand how to godly steward my money. Today, you can sign up in the lobby for something called Financial Peace University. Why does that fall into need to know? Because you're not in crisis. Your finances are in a good state. You just want to be better at stewarding them. What Financial Peace does is walks through how to steward your finances in a godly manner. And you can sign up today in, in the lobby for that. But there's people that need to know. Then there's a the last group of people that come to church and they need help. And they walk through the door and they've got some serious baggage they're carrying from what life's dealt them. Can we, can we just be real honest for a second? Life's really hard, right? Am I, am I the only one? Thanks. I'm glad. I'm the only one life's hard for. Cool. Life's hard. And whether you know it or not, you are going to fall into the category of need help at some point in your life. Here's, here's what I mean. You lose a loved one and, and processing grief. Okay, we, we grow in community. Un, under that, that need help, there's something called grief share where you can go and process your grief with other people that are grieving. Divorce care, you'll find under there. There's recovery for those that go, man, I just need a community for recovery that can help me. There's things like counseling there's other care things in there. There's also prayer. You, you, there's other people that need help. You know who they are? They got to a point in life where they maybe found themselves on one knee 
talking to another human being and they go, we're getting married. Help. (laughs) We don't know how to do this. And the church gets to step in as part of discipleship and walk alongside them and lead towards that wedding day instead of just showing up on that wedding day and being a, a, a somebody who just, I'm here to do a job. It's not a job for us. It's part of discipleship that you would have a strong marriage before you're married, that we can work on it. The same, same when it comes to uh, memorials, that if you've lost a loved one, you know the first question is, what happens now? What do I do? And the church gets to step in and walk alongside you in your, your time of need. And so we're focusing on this discipleship pathway together. The last one is micro locations this year. And you may be going, what are micro locations, right? Well, there's this little community in Paulden, right? And Mike and Sue Lynn, Mike's one of our elders now, but Mike and Sue began to pray about their neighbors. And as they, it was during COVID, so everybody was watching through a screen. And, and during that time, um, Mike and Sue began to pray. God began to tell him, you need to invite that one, invite that one, invite that one, don't invite that one, invite that one, invite that one, don't invite them. Well, Mike and Sue just love everybody, so they invited them. And then they found out why they weren't supposed to invite, not invite the one that they invited. But what they discovered is that their, their neighbors, as they invited them in, came and sat in their living room and they watched and participated in church together. And that group began to grow. And as that group began to grow, Mike and Sue began to sense that there was a need for a a deeper connection on a life group level. And so Sundays weren't enough, so Tuesdays started. And now there's this group at Paulden that are committed to joining together on a Sunday for brunch and being a part of us through a screen. But they've also grown into this community that's doing life together on a Tuesday. And as they've grown, they're now at a step where they're considering and praying through, God, is it time to open this up to all of Paulden that whoever wants to show up can show up? And that's the point of when a micro-location begins. It goes from a group that's gathering to now this open space where people can come in and be a part. How? Utilizing this technology across the screen. You realize that when it comes to the online family, that the design was never for people to just stay in isolation away from each other. That that God gave a gift to the church that we could use technology to reach people anywhere and everywhere. You realize that right here, right now, everyone on the planet is accessible to the church family to complete the mission with. Today, that through this, we have an opportunity that we've never had before. And so this year, we're going to commit to building micro locations, to working into that. How does that start? Online family, I need your help. Because today, some of you are what we would consider watchers. And it's not just the online family. It's in this room as well. It's in our Prescott Valley location. What is a watcher? A watcher is somebody who comes And in this case, they turn on a screen and they just look at that screen and we can't see them. We don't know who they are. And in a room this size, you may be a watcher. But on our online family, what we're asking is that you would take a step of engagement towards relationship and intimacy today. And it's this easy. You just decide that I'm going to give my information today. I'll just let you know I'm here. My name's John and I'm from wherever. And here's my email. It's that easy. And in this room, it's that easy for you that you could walk out these doors, you could take out your phone and you could fill in your information. And all of a sudden, it's no longer you watching us. It's we are now engaged together. What's the heart of that? That if you've already done that online, the next step for an online family is that you would step into a group. Pastor Owen, don't know if you guys know this, but Pastor Owen is doing our first online group together. And instantly there were a bunch of people that joined that. What are they saying? I'm not okay anymore being a watcher. I'm moving towards steps of relationship and intimacy. I'm taking steps of discipleship. I don't know if you're in a group, but if you're not in a group, maybe that's your step of discipleship that you need to take is to move forward and say this year, this is my year. 
I'm committing more to being built up. I'm committing more to being fitted for my purpose. I'm committing more to those around. We're going to finish construction. We're moving out. We're expanding. And you're a vital part to that. But our hope is that over this next year, can, can I dream with you for just two seconds? Right here, right now, as you're in this room, there are people in Alabama. There are people in several spots in California. There are people in Washington State, Montana. There are people in Baghdad, Arizona, Ash Fork, Williams, Flagstaff, right? And, and many, many others. There's a couple in Norway. Can you imagine, church, when we start to just mix the ingredients that God's given us, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, Right? That, that in this time that he's given us, we move outward. And all of a sudden, someone, someone in Alabama goes, hey, I want to be a part of growing the church in Alabama. I want to be part of growing God's kingdom in Omaha, Nebraska. That a group in Prescott that gathered together, that faithfully gave generously, that allowed for this room back here that no one ever sees, that's literally the worst place to be on a weekend. But we have people that faithfully sit back there. Why? Because they're running switchers and they're running all the, all the backend technology that needs to happen so that somewhere across the screen can sit there. You know how that was all funded? By people like you that went, hey, we believe in the vision God's got that we're to reach the world. You played a part in that. But today, someone, someone today in one of those locations, it may be Ash Fork, that they go, I didn't know there was people in Williams. We could get together. And all of a sudden, these micro locations, these groups of people that are committed to the gospel in their community begin to grow in community together and begin to change the dynamic of where they are. That's where we're going over the next year. But it brings me back to you. You're not here by chance. You're not here by accident this morning. You're here because God wants to speak to you. Last time I checked, there's not one of us that has made it to the full measure of Jesus Christ yet, which means we got growing to do. So I want to ask you, what step in your discipleship journey do you need to take today? What's your step? What's your step? Not your neighbors. Don't nudge your husband. What's your step? Because we need you. We need you to complete what God has put in front of us. And then along with that, who, who does God want to use you to help onto the discipleship pathway. Who's that person in your life today that God wants to, wants to use you to bring into and built up? Why? Because we're on a mission, church. We're on a mission to see people encounter Jesus, to engage in their faith and empowered to serve. We're making disciples and it begins with us. And so as you came in, you should have received one of these. What I love about this moment is when Jesus gave us the communion meal, so to speak. He gathered around one table. There wasn't many tables. There was one. And Jesus had a whole bunch of people around that table. And those people were all very different. And yet in that moment, what Jesus was doing was uniting them all together. Why? Because in Jesus, we are held together. Think about it for a second. Just, just let, your, let your mind get outside of yourself and outside of this room. Think about today, all the churches that gathered across the world. There's churches in tribal areas where they held things that are symbolic to communion. that represent bread and wine today. They gather around the same table. There are people in Australia and Asia 
and they gather around the same table. Why? Because it's the church of Jesus. There's one table and you're sitting at it. Can you picture yourself at that first one sitting there gathered? Can you picture Jesus taking a glass of wine? And it says that they divided one glass to the rest. One pitcher to the rest. What is it a picture of? His blood. How are we held together? Through his blood. But there's one Jesus for all of us. And he unites us all in this moment together. He took bread that represented one body. And what did he do? He took one and divided it and passed it to everyone. And they were united at the table together. We are united together in what God has called us to. So in this moment, as you reflect, as you sit with the elements in front of you that represent the body and the blood of Jesus, I just want to give you time to reflect. What is God saying to you? Where does he need you to grow? Please stay away in this moment from beating yourself up. This is not about beating you up. It's about letting God breathe into you where he needs to grow you up because we all got growing to do. And so if you would, you got a moment to reflect and then we'll come back and take it all together. But these, these moments are yours. Jesus took bread and he broke it and he handed it around the table to each one, his body, that it was physically about to be given. We look back, we know it was given for us. That he physically showed up and took on him my sin and my punishment. Took your sin and your punishment that together he would be our savior. And he took bread and he gave it to them. And he said, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus took wine and he divided it and gave it to them and he made connections that it was through the shedding of his blood that there would be forgiveness of sin. That it was through the shedding of his blood that um, the new covenant would come to be that would unite all of us together in one purpose, one mission, one God, one Jesus, one Savior, one Lord. And it was all around one table and he gave him a cup and he said, take drink, do this in remembrance of me. God, thank you for today. Thank you for loving us the way you do. God, thank you for the reminder that we have been given the Holy Spirit. That God, everything we need to live out our faith, we have been given in you. We have been given your spirit and we've been given people, a community that we walk alongside. God, that we would build, would we be a space that you would allow us to build one another up? That God, we would push one another to become more and more and more like Jesus in everything that we do. And so God, I ask for our family that while we may be spread in many places, would you unite us today in Jesus? Would we remind ourselves as we sing and we worship and we declare what a beautiful name the name of Jesus is, what a powerful name because it changes everything. And God, we are grateful just to be called your kids today. Thank you for family. Thank you that we're in this together. Thank you for being our God and that we are your people. We're grateful. And everybody said, amen.